name is Ujwal. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of Motivebase. Uh, but that's not the purpose of today's talk. The purpose of today's conversation is to talk about the power of contextual intelligence. So first and foremost, I'm going to introduce this concept of con contextual intelligence to you if you're not already familiar with it. And obviously put it into the context of modern day technology-based research, big data. Uh, and in particular, talk about how it's allowing us to bring the power of observational ethnography back to the corporate world. Uh, that's me uh, about five minutes ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I said, uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I live and breathe ethnography. I, this is what I've done for the last 15 years in my career. Uh, in fact, when I transitioned from academia to the corporate world, one of the first things that deeply disappointed me was the lack of application of real immersive observational ethnography to the corporate setting. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of logistical reasons why it's not applied, uh, whether it's cost or time or scale and so on and so forth that I'll get into. But this was a huge huge point of um, huge sort of disappointment for me coming in as a as a young anthropologist coming into the field uh, and primarily because I knew of and I could see and I experienced firsthand the power of observation. I experienced its ability to help us uncover hidden meanings in any given context and I say hidden because you know, as human beings, we all, as you all know, we lack the innate ability to be able to look inward and actually put in words the things we experience, the things we innately feel, uh, and the meanings we innately create, inadvertently create around things, ideas, trends, topics in culture. And the power of observational ethnography is its ability to uncover those hidden meanings by simply observing, for example, a group of people around a dinner table having a conversation about a topic. Uh, a trained anthropologist is able to uncover things that no amount of Q&A can help uncover. And this is really the, the exciting part for us about observational ethnography. But again, like I said, the lack of its application in the corporate world is deeply disappointing. And again, I'll, I'll get into that a bit more and talk about how this, the emergence of contextual intelligence can help us reshape that narrative. Uh, but this is really, you know, fundamentally the focus of the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, but of course, you know, in order to conduct ethnography properly, in order to really do uh, observational ethnography properly, we need to understand context and, uh, and in particular, we need to understand the hidden meanings that exist within a given context. And I'll show you a few examples of what I mean by these hidden meanings, just to make things crystal clear. You know, I pulled up an example. This is a real world example, by the way, from data we've collected on the difference between intuitive eating and dieting. Here's the thing, you know, they both carry subtly different, but you know, in many ways from a business perspective, significantly different meanings. Uh, in association with them, you know, for example, intuitive eating is about positive body image, sense of wellness, a spiritual connection with food, dieting, and this is all co consumer created, by the way, it's inadvertently created in culture by people uh, in the way they talk naturally with one another. So dieting is about losing weight, it's about belly fat or addressing the so-called quote unquote problem areas in your body or eating to live rather than a spiritual connection to food. Here's the problem though, you know, you could interview 50,000 people and they will not be able to get you these kinds of nuanced meanings uh, and articulate that and put structure around it. And that's really where observation comes into play because as an anthropologist observing a series of conversations, I can make notes and understand the innate ways in which meanings are created, uh, identify patterns and decode them. And this is something that we can't expect a human being to do, a consumer to do on our behalf. Now, of course, uh, what I'm really going to focus on today is how contextual intelligence is giving us the ability to do exactly this with technology and with big data. But I want to talk about a couple more examples just to really illustrate this point of, you know, these hidden contextual meanings. Here's another example. Again, real world example, natural cleaning versus sustainable cleaning. Natural cleaning from the consumer's 
perspective, a consumer-led perspective is no chemicals, individual ingredients. So focus on what ingredients go into making up this cleaning product, for example. And it's about biodegradability. So the natural cleaning universe has almost become disenfranchised even with recycling. On the other hand, sustainable cleaning means less chemicals, individual ingredients focus as well, but on recyclability. So again, if I look at these two uh, meanings here, they seem subtle, but they're actually significant differences because they represent different cultures, different marketplaces, uh, different microcultures, if I can use that term. And they're driven by different lead users with different motivations and different mindsets and even slightly different sociodemographics. And understanding these subtle differences can make or break a successful or an unsuccessful innovation project. And this is really why observational ethnography is so powerful. Let's take another example in the food world, natural sugar and healthy sugar. Healthy sugars uh, for the consumer means, oh, it's about, you know, sugars, new and emerging sugars that are supposedly lower on the glycemic index. It's about avoiding artificial sugars and about just controlling the grams per day intake. Natural sugar, on the other hand, represents a different microculture. It's about no added sugar, no artificial sugars. It's about only using natural sugars and even avoiding natural sugars in concentrated formats, for example, like juice might have. So it's just really interesting uh, that, again, subtle but significant differences. They represent different microcultures, different marketplaces, uh, and they represent different strategies. And if we did not understand these seemingly subtle but significant uh, differences in meanings that exist around terms that are interrelated, then we not only miss the boat, but we create the wrong strategy geared towards the wrong people, the wrong products geared towards the wrong people, and so on and so forth. And that cycle continues. And this is really the power of observation, and this is really why we are so deeply interested as a company in applying the power of observation, observation to big data and to technology. So context is everything. I don't think any of you are going to argue with that. With that. Uh, but of course, you know, as I mentioned when I started this presentation, corporate observational ethnography has been pretty much dead for a while. You know, there there's some companies that uh, certainly I've seen do some amount of observation, but it's it's minimal. The sample sizes are very small. It comes once in a blue moon, and it, you know, uh, it it comes when there's a luxury of time and money and the resources and so on. And so when we started our company, and one of the reasons actually, one of the motivations for me personally as an anthropologist to start this company was to find a solution for this problem, was to bring back observational ethnography to the corporate world, was to re-engage in uh, being able to conduct observational ethnography and uncover these hidden meanings that only observation, true observation could deliver. But of course, you know, the exciting part and the obvious area where I wanted to look when I started to think about this in the initial days of, of wanting to start our company was uh, in the world of big data. Cause you know, obviously, you know, people, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are having millions of conversations across the internet, across countries day to day. And this presents an incredibly rich data source and it's natural and it's observable. We're not interrupting people, you know, we're not, creating a forced environment for them to engage. We're not asking them to look inward and try to articulate what's going on in their heads. We're interpreting. This is the way an anthropologist would if he or she was observing a dinner table conversation, for example. So, you know, theoretically, big data presented some incredible ways in which we could uncover these nuanced differences that I was talking to you about before. But of course, there was one challenge and that challenge was context, because the more we looked at the big data world and the more we looked at, you know, applying artificial intelligence to big data, the more we realized that, you know, big data and AI, these are all just buzzwords uh, unless we really create a solution for the underlying problem, which is what an anthropologist would solve if they were in field, right, which is, an anthropologist, I'll give you a real world example. Uh, you know, last night I was at a dinner with some friends and the conversation started about fermented foods and different people were talking about how they're introducing fermented foods into their lives. 
not every person mentioned the term fermented food, but of course they were talking contextually. So if I put my anthropologist hat on in that moment or in that half hour period when the conversation got pretty heated about fermented foods and how to use it and how to apply it and what to buy against it and so on. As an anthropologist, I would observe and understand and take notes of the different meanings being created around fermented foods. Whether people actually mention the term as immaterial, the point is that I innately know that, you know, somebody, person B is responding to person A, they're not using the term fermented foods, but, you know, they're clearly responding in context. And then, of course, when randomly person C goes on a rant about, I don't know, something his daughter does that's super cute, I know that that has nothing to do with the fermented foods conversation and I can put my notepad down and ignore what that person just said. Uh, and, and that innate understanding of what is contextual and non-contextual is what a human being has in field. And the challenge we had to solve was to teach a machine to do that. And therein was born the idea of contextual intelligence. So let me give you a simple example to illustrate the challenge we had to solve and how we solved it. So let's say you're interested in studying the culture of the diet. So you want to understand what kinds of meanings exist in culture around the term diet. What do people care about? What's in their mental model? The most obvious way you would do that, and this is what most analytics companies would do, is literally go and run searches for mentions of the term diet. So person number one might mention low carb, high fat, they would, and they would also mention the term diet in a particular post. Great. Now, low carb, high fat has been associated with diet. Person number two talks about diet and also talks about reducing sugar. Great. Reduce sugar also related to diet. Person number three talks about diet and also uses the term health. Great. LCHF, reduce sugar and health were all mentioned directly in the same sentence as or in the same post by the same user as the term diet. This is what most technologies do because it's easy to do. I can go and run a literal search for the term diet, look at all other terms mentioned in the same post, quantify them and look for patterns. The problem is that's not an ethnography. That's some sort of a pattern recognition analysis. It's a rational analysis of linguistics possibly, but it's not an ethnography and it certainly does not help us uncover any hidden meanings. So let's continue with this example. Let's imagine that person number four in the same conversation forum thread, let's say it's happening on a forum, person number four responds, they do not use the term diet, but they talk about a positive body image. What's happened here? A typical analytics tool would ignore person number four, but we shouldn't because they have responded contextually to the conversation about diet they are talking about positive body image, which is now adding meaning to what diet means in culture at any given point in time. And I'll come to the temporal aspect shortly. But positive body image is now related to diet because it is just as relevant as health and reduced sugar and LCHF. But the machine has to understand that person number four, even though they didn't mention the term diet, they responded contextually. This is what we had to build. Similarly, let's continue with this example. Person number five also does not use the word diet, but talks about, you know, what they consider to be a normal sized human being. And it's in relation to body image and, you know, it's still relevant, but again, they're giving meaning to what diet means in culture, even though they're not using the term diet. Now we've got person number seven or sorry, person number six here talking about social pressure they feel around conforming or looking a certain way. Again, not mentioning the term diet, but giving meaning to what diet means in culture. And now I'll go one step further. Somewhere else in some other forum, there's a discussion where modern feminism has been linked to positive body image. And that is a one, well, that is a one hop away relationship, but it is a relationship. And it is an indication of what might be coming to the universe or the culture of diet. All of these are relevant in understanding. All of these are relevant if we want to do the equivalent of an observational ethnographic analysis, an anthropological analysis of the term diet in culture 
and if we want to do it with big data and with the online world. And this is what I mean when I say contextual intelligence. This is the technology we have to create as a company. This is the technology we want other organizations to create. If they, if they want to and care about the power of observational ethnography, because it allows us to uncover things that otherwise we would have completely lost in the equation. For example, if you were doing a project on the culture of diet and you followed a traditional analytics model or you interviewed people or put people in a focus group, you would miss out on all these relationships around positive body image or feminism or this uh, normalcy in size or body shape or social pressures men and women feel and so on and so forth. And these hidden meanings are what allow us opportunity for innovation. Without that, we're just doing what every other person is doing and we're just doing what commoditized research is doing. And this is really what we mean by contextual intelligence, but I'm gonna take this one step further. By doing this with big data, by doing this in the online world, we are able to solve two really important problems that in-field ethnographers couldn't even dream of 30 years ago or even 10 years ago, which is that typically, and you know, if I think back to, I did a six month long in-field ethnography observational, uh, I think I spoke to about 85 or 90 people in that process. It took me six months to do this and 85, 90 people. Uh, and it's very difficult to know which 85, 90 people I've just spoken to. Did I speak to the early adopters, the late majority, a mix of them? Did I miss out on a portion of the marketplace that is giving me a skewed understanding of what's going on? So that's one problem that big data helps us solve. The sheer volume of data just validates insights so quickly and allows us to quantify ethnography. The second thing it also does is this. If you think that down to that example of modern feminism, which is one hop away, no amount of infield work can help me understand these hops, can help me understand these emerging meanings, and more importantly, quantify those emerging meanings. That's really the power of applying contextual intelligence to big data, and it kind of puts the world of observational ethnography on steroids, if I can, if I can kind of call it that. But, but let's get, dig into this a little bit more because I wanna talk about this notion of measurement, right? This notion of quantification. Uh, and you'll see this, this word, this uh, term D here, this distance measurement. I, I just wanna explain that with a simple example. Let's continue with this example I mentioned here around diets. And let's imagine that you know, we've scraped um, you know, hundreds of thousands of conversations, if not millions around this topic. We've got this topic universe of uh, that shows the different meanings that revolve around diet. Now let's imagine that in the context of diet, the term positive body image, let's imagine that this was mentioned 1,000 times in the time frame under examination. Let's imagine that reduced sugar was only mentioned 500 times. LCHF was only mentioned 100 times. And I don't know, social and modern feminism only mentioned twice, okay? Now what have I just done? I've added a relative measure of size. And I'm simplifying this model, obviously, but what I've done here is given the machine an understanding that, oh, interesting, in this time frame, positive body image is way more relevant to the term diet or to the culture of diet than reduced sugar. So positive body image, the closest to diet in semantic distance, reduced sugar, the next in semantic distance, LCHF, the next in semantic distance, and modern feminism, the last one in semantic distance, and so on and so forth. And this kind of quantification, you know, in, in no amount of infield work can allow us to do that. And that's the benefit of big data. That's the benefit of taking big data and putting observational ethnography on steroids is that first, we can quantify and understand which meanings are more and less relevant to a particular topic and culture. Now I'll take this one step further. Let's introduce the notion of temporality or time into the picture. And let's take this example of positive body image. Let's imagine that positive body image started off somewhere here and then it moved somewhere here, uh, somewhere here. And let's say this is over the course of a year, somewhere here and then it went somewhere there. Now the other benefit of big data is that I can also use simple regression models to understand and identify temporally over time, which meanings are growing in relevance and which meanings are shrinking in relevance, which is 
liquid gold or liquid platinum or whatever else it is for an anthropologist or for a researcher because now I'm understanding how culture is actually changing. We're building a living, breathing model of culture and we're understanding not just the past, but we can understand how the past is shaping the future because we actually are able to measure, quantitatively measure culture, the meanings that people associate with topics over time. This is the power of contextual intelligence. And by the way, what I'm giving away here is a huge part of our intellectual property, but I'm giving this away because this is something we're so passionate about. Yes, we're doing incredible work with hundreds of companies in this space, but we also want to see this kind of thinking to be the norm. We don't want to be one of the only ones shouting from rooftops about the value of observational ethnography. And that's because we see uh, our clients solve all kinds of problems and save uh, millions of dollars, both in terms of bad decisions, avoiding bad decisions, making good decisions, and of course, saving face in terms of, you know, the, the fallout of bad decision making. And I'll give you three examples, three real world examples of stuff we did with clients. I can't go into specifics of what product or what brand, of course, uh, but I'll mention a couple of in interesting case studies that will put all of this into context. How did contextual intelligence allow us to bring observational ethnography into this organization and help them uncover something critically in time um, that saved a particular innovation from failure? Natural beauty. So this is a great one. A client spent 18 months researching, uh, did all kinds of research about what natural beauty means. They uncovered all the usual stuff, right? It shouldn't have a natural beauty product, shouldn't have parabens and you know, should be cruelty free or avoid harsh chemicals and certain kinds of ingredients and ideally be organic and all of that stuff. What they didn't uncover, because again, they didn't have contextual intelligence. Uh, and they, by the way, they also used big data analytics to do this too. But because they didn't have the contextual intelligence, what they didn't know is that fragrance, even if it is a naturally derived fragrance, like a lavender fragrance, the moment the product has fragrance, it automatically is, is assumed by the consumer to have something negative in it, as in something not so natural in it. That's just the assumption, that's the mental model that exists, which means a small issue like this could affect the overall success and the ability of the brand, it was a new brand launch, the ability of the brand to really distinguish itself from all the other natural counterparts that existed. Second thing that client missed, almost missed, was preservatives. So we found that not only did the product need to have a shelf life, but it also needed to have a shelf life that was less than one year. Again, consumer's mental model means, okay, this must have less preservatives, this must be more active, this must be more efficacious. And this allows the consumer to solve the mental battle of, oh, if I buy natural, is it gonna be just as good? Is it gonna still solve my problems, whether it's wrinkle reduction or dark circle reduction or whatever else it might be. And that's the interesting thing. Again, two things that contextual intelligence gave us that otherwise we would have been completely missed. Here's another example. Um, in the area of oral health and good bacteria, a uh, client was studying this space for a long time. They had a lot of uh, good research around the connection to obviously dental problems and cavities and inflammation and all that good stuff, all the stuff circled in blue. But again, what they missed out on was a specific issue that would make the consumer care about good bacteria and oral health. In particular, we found a connection to canker sores and ulcers was the quick way in for the client. So it in essence showed us through contextual intelligence, we identified the way into the marketplace to create a competitive advantage, step in early uh, and to set the innovation apart. Uh, another example, alternative meat, uh, you know, again, client had so much research about the popularity of vegan solutions and plant-based solutions and so on. What they hadn't realized was that one of the key drivers for consumer interest in alt meat was consumer concern about the quality of regular meat, as in people were concerned about what the cows were fed or what the animal was fed. People were concerned about, you know, I don't know, pesticide and glyphosate leakage. People were concerned about what kind of health impact long-term it may have you know, may not be measurable in the short term. All these concerns were affecting uh, the alt meat market and were affecting the alt meat market just as much as concerns about health 
nutrition, taste, and of course, sustainability. Again, such an important demand space that without contextual intelligence would have been completely missed and would have completely prevented the client from creating a series of products, series of hybrid products and solutions that otherwise would have lost them millions of dollars, right? And again, they would have been in the shiny object syndrome as opposed to saying, I know what people really want and why they want it. So this is why we're so excited about contextual intelligence and so excited about its ability to bring back uh, observational research. But, there, but more importantly, you know, the reason this is so important in today's world and the reason why uh, you know, I am so passionate about observational ethnography is because you know, the interesting thing, and I'll, I'll doodle here for one second, is that you know, if you kind of think about front-end innovation and you break it out into two parts, the front front-end and the rare front-end, um, what you find is that in the second half of front-end innovation, which is really the, if you think about the impact of design thinking, we've made a lot of strides, right? As organizations, we've implemented all kinds of methods to introduce design thinking, co-creation sessions, empathy building. We've done a lot in the second half of the design uh, or of the front-end innovation process. The first half of the front-end innovation process, the process where we identify the opportunity space and quantify it and determine whether it's worth our time and money. That's the part where we've made very little stride. We still do the same form of research. We still rely on syndicated reports and trend reports, and we still do all the stuff that leads to this number. 95% of innovations still fail, and that number hasn't gone down in the last decade despite improvements in design thinking. So it's interesting, right? Once you identify the right opportunity, yes, design thinking and the, the overall consumer-led lens has made huge strides in helping us design better products. But the, the top half of the front-end innovation process is where we continue to suck. And that's the problem that we're trying to solve. And that's the problem that observational ethnography can solve so significantly, but of course, Traditional observation and ethnography is pretty much impossible to do today. The sheer pace of market development, you know, what our clients see in trends six months ago is different, and it may be nuanced difference, but it's still there's a nuanced difference in six months, and there will be more nuanced differences in another 12 months, and probably massive differences in 24 months. If we don't understand these and have a pathway, then we're missing the boat, and we're always too late, and we're always just... Uh, you know, competing on price and features as opposed to competing on a net new innovative um, you know, solution advantage, right? And, and this is the problem that observational ethnography, traditional observational ethnography can't solve. And, you know, and of course, add to the fact, add to that the fact that it costs a lot of money and time. Uh, I understand why, why in the corporate world we don't do a lot of observational work. Um, and that's the exciting part about contextual intelligence is that it can help us solve a lot of these problems and, again, push observational ethnography, put it on steroids, you know, allow us. So, for example, through our work, we're able to allow our clients to do observational ethnography sometimes in seconds, right? They can run quick scans in seconds. They can do deep ethnographies in three to five business days with our help. We can do you know, ethnographies where we're getting data from hundreds of thousands of unique individuals and hundreds of thousands of data points, uh, and it allows us to avoid a lot of the uh, biases that result from interruption or just from uh, putting people outside of their natural um, habitat, natural uh, zone of engagement, format of engagement. Uh, and then most importantly, it allows us to put it on steroids, right? It allows us to quantify culture, size opportunities, calculate growth rates, predict the volatility of trends, predict the future impact, and most importantly, that allows us to know how much we should invest and when and, and to what extent. And I think this is the impact that we've been waiting to make as a company. And, uh, you know, we're excited about the impact we're starting to now make since the launch of this technology 14 months ago. Uh, but, you know, for us, the real value of CI, contextual intelligence, is that it allows big data, which otherwise is just data, and it turns it into thick big data. And, you know, for those of you who are familiar with that term, the moment it becomes thick, it, it becomes rich with contextual information. When it becomes rich with contextual information, it enables true observational ethnography. And that's, that's really the purpose of, of why I'm here and what I wanted to talk about. This is an exciting time for us. 
uh, obviously, and, um, you know, this is, uh, this is the future of how we're enabling research in a completely different and agile manner. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it sets the stage up for what this thing is capable of doing. Okay. Um, I'm just pulling up the app here. I do have a few questions that, uh, that I can take in order. Uh, and um, I, I also am mindful of the time. We are 32 minutes in, so I've uh, kept my promise here. So uh, if you would like to drop, you are welcome to drop. I appreciate your time on this webinar. Uh, I'm going to take another five minutes, address a few of the questions that have come in, and then uh, um, we will give you some time back. So first and foremost, uh, the first question here is about uh, the measurement and the semantic distance uh, calculation and uh, and how um, and how it can be done. So you know, it's it, it's, a, it's the question you're asking is a very talent, challenging and a technical question. Um, the simplest way I can I can say this is that if you can understand, so imagine a forum discussion where you know somebody starts a conversation about fermented foods and you have a thousand responses, and this is quite common, right? Um, so imagine you're on reddit.com and you see a thousand responses against a conversation about fermented foods. The first task at hand is to figure out out of those thousand, which are contextual. So let's say you figure that out. You realize, okay, 800 of them are contextual. 200 are nonsense. You know, they're spam or non-contextual. Somebody was you know, promoting something. Somebody went on a rant about, uh, I don't know, politics or whatever else it might be. Uh, and so, the first step is separating that out. Once you've done that, the next step is to convert the contextual conversations into topics, so top, topicify those, those uh, conversations, because once you've topicified them, you can then start to look at the relative volume of those topics and understand and start to think about which of those topics are closer to the sun, the sun being uh, fermented foods and further away. So it's kind of, if you put the physics analogy to this, it's kind of like saying, you know, I'm going to create this model of the solar system. Uh, you know, once I create all the topics, I'm going to determine which planets are closer to the sun and further away, and I'm going to create some sort of relative sizing system of it. And then, of course, if I have temporal data attached to that, now I can look at that um, month over month or week over week and understand how that changes. So that's really the power of this. Uh, a relate, related question to this is about... Um, doing this using non-English forms? Yes, absolutely. So um, it, for us personally, yes, we have, at the moment we do this in the US and the UK, so that's English. Uh, we are working on uh, a version in China, which obviously interprets man, the Mandarin language. We're also working on one in, in Latin America. Um, and so yes, absolutely it is doable. We've already run feasibilities on these. Uh, we're just building them uh, one at a time, uh, just, you know, obviously uh, based on demand that comes from our clients. Uh, the next question relates to the data sources. So, you know, it's a good question. This is a question that often comes up, um, you know, even when we're talking to clients for the first time. Um, you know, in order to enable ethnography, we realized early on that there is a, it's a, it's, there, there is a quality discussion, right, that we need to have. Because in order to enable ethnography, we actually need to uh, go and seek content from platforms that enable two things. One is long form engagement. So platforms that allow people to talk about their lives, to link their beliefs and values to their attitudes and, and opinions. Uh, and certainly platforms like you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter do not enable that, right? Those platforms enable short form like share uh, forms of discussion. They don't enable long form deep conversations, which is what is needed for ethnography. The second thing uh, is that uh, is pseudonymity, the second criteria. Pseudonymity is amazing. We've spent a decade in social sciences research uh, learning that, and of course nowadays this is pretty common knowledge, the moment you hide behind a pseudonym, your actual face and name isn't on your profile you become free to talk about your, your social, political beliefs and values. You become free to talk, express your opinions, to ask questions that otherwise you'd be too embarrassed to ask and to discuss things that otherwise are just too stressful or too stigmatized to discuss. Just take issues around mental health, issues around sexual health, issues around uh, um, you know, anything that makes us feel vulnerable as human beings. You, know, it's, you don't have these conversations on platforms like Facebook, you have these conversations on platforms 
uh, like babycenter.com or reddit.com forums where, you know, we can have deep conversations or even the threaded conversations under blogs where, you know, we can express who we really are, talk about our vulnerabilities and, and uh, you know, try to resolve them. So these are really the two criteria that we take as an input in order to enable ethnography. And of course, the good thing about today's world is that a majority of the activity on the internet, we don't often realize it, but a majority of the activity on the internet actually happens in the long form platforms, right? On forums, on comment sections, under blogs or YouTube videos. These are the places where the real magic happens and we wanna be able to tap into that to enable uh, contextual analysis and enable you know, big data ethnography. Uh, I have one last question here that uh, I can also get into here. Um, uh, so, so this question uh, really pertains to um, specifics to our business model. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is on the screen. I'm happy to talk to you about what we can do for you and you know, contextualize all of that. I don't want to get into that here. Uh, but what I will say is that, um, you know, if you're thinking about cost, the cost of, for the cost of, you know, doing a project or two over the course of the year, you can do tens, if not hundreds of projects by enabling technology, uh, by enabling it with technology, right? And that's really the power of this. So yes, there's cost savings, but you don't lose out on quality by implementing cost savings. If anything, it's the opposite. We're actually pushing the boundaries of what ethnography is capable of. And most importantly, and I'll say this out loud, you know, most of our clients are, are senior management and they have to manage up as well as manage down. And when they manage up, oftentimes they have to translate, you know, deep consumer led ethnographic insights into stuff that senior management wants to spend five minutes on. Right. And the benefit of quantifying the value of ethnography is that you can manage up very easily. It's easy to say, uh, hey, you know, the culture of men's grooming uh, is impacted in such a way that 42 percent of young men, uh, you know, now look at this. Now look at the act of buying a set of products for personal grooming as the new definition of masculinity. They consider, you know, being open to. Uh, you know, criticism that men have had in culture about, you know, what is toxic masculinity. They understand these topics. They want to have these dialogues. And this 42% is spending 3x of what they used to spend uh, or, you know, is growing by 32% year over year. Those kinds of conversations are easy to manage up. It's very difficult uh, to instead say, hey, you know, I did this ethnography of 20 people and I noticed this pattern of people being very progressive and, you know, spending a lot of money, but we don't know how much of the population this applies to. Uh, no 